Hello, thank you for having me on. I'm absolute pleasure to be here today. Thank you. Um, so we met in June when all the pandemic hit, and you, your personality really caught my eye, caught my attention. You're very uplifting. You're very inspiring, and I thought, hmm, what? I wonder what his story is. So tell us a little bit about your story, and my cat will just walk around. <laughs> Your cat will walk around and I'm sure my kid will walk through the door at any moment. So we'll, we'll get through it. So my story started when I left the Marine Corps in 2007. I left with the simple idea that I was meant for something bigger in my life, but I really had no idea what that was. I just knew like the Marine Corps was going to hold me back and I needed to stretch my wings to get out. The problem was I got lost in the system for about 10 years after I transitioned out. I just adopted what civilians and what the military told us we need to do, get a job get married, start a family, do the GI Bill, and life should be ra rainbows and unicorns. But the problem was, as you start your life, as you start a job, I was using the GI Bill. Eventually, I was going to the College of Engineering and eventually got to the point where I just wasn't good at it and I had to drop out. And for all of those 10 years, this degree, which is what they told us to get, was my grass was gonna get greener on the other side. As long as I get that piece of paper, it was gonna get better. And I still probably had like five, six more years to do it part-time wise. And I just really felt like it was gonna get better. Well, then when, it's, when you drop out, but no one tells you, it's gone, the grass just dries up and you're like, okay, well, there's, there's no fine print that says, what do you do if you can't graduate with the, your GI Bill? And what do you do? Like, how do you figure out what you're supposed to do in life? Because they just tell you you're supposed to have a degree and that's supposed to make everything better. Mm -hmm. And that was about in 2013. And my daughter, my first daughter was about two years old. And I just remember looking in her eyes and be like, what kind of man am I? What kind of man am I going to be to my husband? Like, what kind of father am I going to be that you're going to look up to? And I was really doing a lot of soul searching on the inside. And that was about, I think, 30 years old that time. And when the grass dried up, I'm struggling to look in my daughter's eyes of like who I really am as a man. The crazy part is through all of that process, I went through about six months of just kind of going through life, rinsing, repeating each day. I went to a seminar and it was just a pretty silly seminar making the transition from staff to super supervisor. I wouldn't say there was anything game changer there except a person with a golden voice who talked about leadership. Mm -hmm. And he, I kept raising my hand with all his questions and I was like, I know all these answers, like, but I've never really acknowledged I knew all these answers. I had forgotten it. And the Marine Corps taught me all these things about leadership. I just had forgotten I was capable of using them. And that lit the spark that I wonder what else I know and what else I can learn. And he gave me the name Zig Ziglar during that conference to be able to look up Zig Ziglar and like, whoa, Zig Zig's like a thread that just keeps going three miles deep. And I started getting hooked on Zig Ziglar stuff, started listening to his podcast, started listening to other podcasts once I learned about other podcasts and just got really hooked on learning because I really fell in love with Zig's idea that you are where you are because of what has gone into your head and you can change where you are and who you are by changing what goes into your mind. And I was like, I can do this. I just have to re bring in new ideas. The problem was I brought in way too many ideas. I probably went on like a knowledge binge for like two and a half years and didn't do anything with it, which I wouldn't recommend because it just creates analysis paralysis, especially if you have an over analytical mind like mine. It really took me starting a blog in 2017 where I started to put some thoughts to words and that morphed into a veteran blog and a veteran business to try to help people. But it really wasn't clear enough. And I didn't do anything other than really blog at that point. But then 2018, I went to a conference for military influencers. And I told my story about being a father, struggling to come home to my family. And I told it to a military spouse. And she started crying. And in that moment, I was like, my story just did that. Like, I didn't do anything bit magical there. I just told who I was and she felt something because her husband came home from war, but didn't emotionally come home. He's on autopilot. Mm -hmm. And I realized in that moment that my voice, my story could do something. And three months later is when I launched my podcast, Military Veteran Dad. I did that podcast for a year while I had a career. And then fast forward to 2020, I lost that job through a reorg, got pushed into entrepreneurship well before I was ready. Mm -hmm. focused on trying to be a stay-at-home dad. Then COVID hit. Then stay-at-home dad meant a whole new different thing because now the kids and everybody is home. And But it was at the same time, it was exactly what I wanted. So like being part of my kid's education, like it was an amazing time. And I just dug deeper and deeper this year of 2020. Got to enjoy amazing memories. And now that the kids are back in school, I'm even stretching my wings further. You mentioned being 
getting my first speaking gig recently. Like that was amazing because professional speaking is really where my heart is. I've recognized this year more than others that one of my gifts is my ability to put words and emotions together and gifts an emotion and a feeling that people aren't recognizing. Even I was just at a wedding recently and I gave a groomsman speech and people came up to me and like they, like they made a comment like you had me within the first three sentences. And it just kind of revalidated like I'm in the right spot. And mm -hmm. that's been my life. Like my job right now is to be a dadpreneur, a stay-at-home dad. My kids are eight, four and are eight, six and four. And there's nothing more in life that I want right now to be a dad. And my focus is try to build a dadpreneur business that can facilitate that for me. Mm -hmm. it, it sounds all too easy, right? And, and I think you just- That's you, five you, years of hard work and manual yes, labor. <laughs> but, but here we are, we're talking about it. We just spent seven minutes and, and describing our lifetime story. So I kind of wanted to go back and highlight a little bit in terms of that self-identity that you were struggling with, you know, coming off from being a military, um, um, you trained in military and, and that was what you understood as what life is. That's what life is all about, being in the military and now you're off duties. So what now, what next, right? What was going through in your mind during that period of time? I would say when I first transitioned out, nothing, because I felt like I had the, because they put you through a how to be a civilian again program, mm -hmm. and they give you what I call a kind of CAPS code. It's called Transitional Assistance Program. So they give you this code, you get out, you get a suit, you get an interview, you get a job. I did that within the first two weeks. And so I didn't have like a hard transition, and I felt like I had kind of beat the statistics. But the problem was I just kind of ran on that autopilot and just ran on that basic idea but didn't really do any, I didn't really feel like I had lost anything. I probably, if I would look, reflect back, there probably was something that I was still missing. Mm -hmm. I wasn't quite asking myself hard questions at that point, or I wasn't asking myself, what could I be doing? Or I wasn't reading at that point. I wasn't doing anything to kind of move my life forward. I was putting on weight, just kind of like life. You, physically, I could look about how heavy I was as life w was given me. And it really just kind of transcended right up until that point where my daughter was born and I went to that seminar. But there was one pit before that that really kind of opened up me to this whole idea of where I am today and my own realization of what my actual identity is. Because before I didn't really understand my identity or even understand that's the question you should ask yourself. Mm -hmm. But what I realized when I first turned 30, I went through a midlife crisis and no one really talked about turning 30 as a midlife crisis, but I had one. And that crisis was that I was going to die alone and nobody was going to say nice things. And funny enough, it was triggered by Jay Leno leaving The Tonight Show. So when he left The Tonight Show for good and the final one, he had all these people come out and say how much his life meant to them and they wouldn't be where they are today without Jay being there. And I was thinking to myself, I don't think a single person would care whether I was here or not on this earth. But you were married and, and you, had a, you had a daughter already. Right? I, I had all of that, but this was a question that, that other than my immediate family, like it's just kind of, I think something men go through is like, do we feel significant? Mm -hmm. In that moment, I was like, I am just a number in a cog that spins around and I just didn't feel alive on the inside. And it took someone asking me a question that really kind of made me question a lot more things in my life. And they said, if you want a result in your life you've never had, you need to do something that you've never done. And I was like, okay, I understand the question. Where can I point it at? And for me, it was friends. I had always wanted friends. I never had them in high school. I never, I had a few good ones in the Marine Corps, but didn't create any ones on the other side of that transition. I probably had one good friend in my life after getting out of the Marine Corps. And so friends was that the answer. What, what's that result? Well, I didn't have any friends. Well, I got to ask like, what's something I'm not doing? Because I'm doing everything that everybody else does. Yeah. And for me, it was, I wasn't talking to people. Every person I would talk to was that high school girl that was going to reject me. So early in life, there was a limiting belief that I should avoid rejection because that feeling really stinks. And so I applied that to everything. And, but that's a key component to have friends. And so I eventually reached the point, I'm like, you know what, I gotta just do it. And so I started with dads at the park, very safe place. If you're a dad at the park, you're usually at least trying. And I'd always seen dads there. I'd always wanted to say hello, but I'd always told myself, they just wanna play with their kids. They probably had a long day just like me. And I'll just leave them alone. Well, I eventually just worked up the courage and I just said, hey, how old are your kids? And turns out they wanted to talk just as much as I did. They were just waiting for someone to go first. And the reason why this point is so important is because that lesson 
that people are willing to be friends and they're willing to talk. When you start duplicating that with other friends and other areas and all aspects of your life, your friends become the mirror to the value, your identity, the intangibles that your mind can't see, especially with what you work on, the limiting self-beliefs and self-talk. Yeah. If you have a negative voice echoing inside your head, you're not going to be able to reflect or see the true value of your worth being on this planet. And friends is such a powerful way to have that value. So much of the things that I, I mean, I wouldn't have understood that my word is something that's something special if I hadn't have people consistently tell me like, Ben, I love the way you put your words together. That feedback came from someone else, not my own head. Mm -hmm. And that pivotal point is, I mean, friends is the core reason that changed everything. Because when you feel connected, when you feel you can have a conversation, when you can feel like you can share a heavy day, maybe you did have a bad day, maybe something happened and you needed someone to talk to, like that's what men need and that's what I needed. And that opened up so many more doors for me to see different possibilities. And I now have a mindset like you're always one conversation away from something amazing and you're going to miss 100% of those shots you don't take. And every con like I wouldn't be a dadpreneur or a stay-at-home dad if I hadn't had a conversation with each of those that said like, wow, I could actually be a stay-at-home dad. Who thought? No one ever told me that when I got out of the Marine Corps. That came from a conversation with a friend. So like it just opens up your world in a way that you can't get any other way. Mm -hmm. And there's one thing, you know, I can, I can uh, second everything that Ben has just said, because you would, you would never imagine sitting in the classroom with, with Ben, and there he is, he looks very introverted, he looks very quiet, but suddenly when you open up the conversation, oh man, you got to mute him. <laughs> I've heard that said that I'm a very silent, stoic person, but then I'm a very warming individual when I open up. Yeah, when you open up, you do open up. And, and it's very deep, meaningful conversation. It's not shallow. It's not something that you just made up and, and just trying to be nice to people. You really give, you know, deep, meaningful conversation. And so it's always been that, like, er, like an early indicator of this. And like in college, I was always the guy that would ask the calculus professor five minutes before the bell, like, can you show that problem one more time? Like I've always been a person of questions my entire life. I just wasn't using that curiosity to really effectively move my life forward. I was using it just to answer silly questions about how does calculus work better. Mm -hmm. So we talked a lot about um, where you were before and now here you are um, making that transition, made that transition and here you are, you're home. And so, so if you were to share and create some type of impact with your message, what would that be? What would that message be that you want to share with the world? The message that I share with the world is that the priorities you make in life matter. And the one that I realized through the podcast more than anything is the commitment to your wife or whoever you call your significant other. That commitment is the one that goes to the end of time. And our connection and our choices each day don't often reflect that as the most important priority. Like every commitment you make will be a lesser commitment than the one you made to your wife and, and my wife. And I realized that and I had to realign my priorities because everything, nothing is more important than that commitment that I'm still going to want to love her at 25 years and 30 years. And if I don't prioritize that now, I'm just borrowing from a credit card that's eventually going to go bankrupt. And so priorities and how you live your life is a major aspect of making sure that you live a fulfilled life. The other one is recognizing that your ego is the one thing that's going to argue why it's not possible. Really, I mean, all the things that I've done in my life, I've fought my ego tooth and nail of, of why I can't do it. I still struggle with it today, but you just have to learn to take that continuous action. But just understand how that ego is going to prevent you from sharing something vulnerable. But vulnerability is a magnetism that allows you to create something bigger. And it's that ego that will often just keep you mediocre. And you need to turn off that ego to really reveal and find your truth of who you are. And the third one is we already kind of hinted on the relationships and friendships. Just understanding that we were never meant to do life alone for a millennia, men and women survived in tribes. And it's only in the last 150 years that we really thought we could do it alone. But we were never designed and wired to do life alone. We need people ahead of us. We need people behind us. I've always liked to explain it like a barrel of monkeys. Like you always want to have one hand up reaching to the elders and people that are wiser than you above you asking for help. But then also recognize that you are wiser and an elder for someone below you and keeping a hand down and understanding that you need those relationships. You need those networks. 
and people talk about the power of a network and career and all that different stuff. It's the real deal because there is so much possibility on the other side of a conversation. Like I, I shortcut it to the power of hello is one of the sharpest, most powerful tools that we know today, because in a single hello, you can change someone's world or you can change your own. Like literally someone could tell you about a way that you could live your life that you've always wanted, but you've never even knew existed. So it's on the other side of the conversation and a relationship that you've got to work on building. Mm -hmm. Wow. So that's pretty powerful. So, so uh, priority, right? Setting up your priority and then also um, just understanding your ego, the message. Your ego is going to be the one reason why it doesn't work. And you got to recognize that and be mindful of it and just keep hitting it down like a a -a whack-a-mole game because it's going to keep popping up. Yeah. And then the last one is the friendships to, to building connection around you. Mm -hmm. So, I, one of the things I wanted to go back to is because I, I think you brought up a good point about the ego. The ego um, gets in the way of doing a lot of things. So now, now that you're a life coach, you're a blogger, you're a podcaster, there's a lot of things that also talk about the mindset and that deals with the ego. What, what about the ego? What is ego? Ego is like the battle to be normal. So your ego wants to constantly keep things safe Ego is kind of also related to your flight or flight, like your brain's wired to keep you safe from lions and tigers and bears, but there are no lions and tigers and bears. The best explanation of ego where I use it as kind of a a teaching tool within coaching Mm -hmm. is wherever you feel your ego the strongest is, most likely there's something in the darkness that you're trying to keep out of the light. And so your ego is almost like a defense mechanism of your brain protecting whatever you have in the shadows. And you'll, you'll actually, when you feel like someone that has a really strong ego, I almost imagine it as they're rotating a light inside their head as they're talking to make sure that the light of whatever you actually are talking about never truly hits the shadow, that they're going to hide truly what they're feeling or some really insecure emotion. And that's in that shadow. But the crazy part that you don't realize is just by bringing it into the light, it loses its power, but then also it becomes something to be inspired by that what you're scared of the most is actually something that will inspire someone to do amazing things. Like people who have some of the hardest struggles in life, even Oprah, if you've ever heard Oprah's backstory, she came from nothing in Mississippi and she's taken her story and moved mountains. Like you understand that what's in the shadows is actually what's meant to be brought in the light, but your ego is going to keep you from doing it. And even for me, the battle that I still face, even today, it still is a morning issue for Almost 15 years, I had somewhere to be every single morning, that there was always somewhere else, whether it be the Marine Corps, being downstairs for formation to go run, or whether it be at work, I got to be at work at AM. There was always these things that I was keeping me going. Mm -hmm. Since losing my job in January, I've really struggled to beat the ego because my ego says a normal life is an eight to five, and I need to get back to that career mindset that, that you're safe, you have a paycheck. And I fight this daily to not go back to that, that I'm rewiring my conscious to understand that there is a different way to find happiness. But that's a 15 year truth that my brain understands. And it felt super safe there. You just go to work, you collect money. Like that is a very safe transaction. But for me, I felt mediocre the entire time. So I knew there was something bigger. But at the same time, even through I'm doing all of this, my ego is still out of fight to keep me back and get me back into an eight to five because that's where it felt safe. That's where it knows how the world works. And when you get outside your comfort zone, like I am, like I'm in a world where every day I'd, I've never lived as a stay-at-home dad. The first four weeks of being a stay-at-home dad were a hot mess. <laughs> and every day I was like, yep, that didn't work. Yeah, nope, that didn't work. And just kind of reiterating every day. And the funny part is I, the week before everything locked down at the end of March, I finally had figured it out. I was like, this is the perfect week. I got the routine down. Kids are going where they need to go. I'm doing what I need to get done. And poof, the world explodes and everybody locks down. And then I had to reinvent everything again. And But that ego is still there, even though it never really stops because wherever you're moving to, your brain still wants you to go back to where you're moving from. And that's your ego is in this basic form is going back to where you felt safe and it's just going to keep pulling you back and you just got to be aware of it. And it's something that doesn't really ever go away. It becomes kind of a trustworthy friend that you're going in the right direction. Like when you feel your ego trying to pull you back, you almost know that you're going somewhere special. Another way to say it is the more something scares you, like the idea of being a stay-at-home dad and a dadpreneur is super scary. You're on your own to make money. 
But the more something that scares you, the more something's amazing on the other side, but your brain won't let you see that because it wants you to go back. So I use fear as a compass. Like the more something scares me, the more I need to start running towards it because that's me, something really cool on the other side and they need to get there like professional speaking, which is super scary, but it's also super amazing when you can make an impact to a hundred people by just giving a 30 minute speech. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I've seen uh, how Ben speak and, and right now he's speaking. So you know how powerful he can be when he's on the stage and it was just very amazing, very uh, inspiring, not to say, and very motivational for sure. Um, I think one, one thing I'm really curious, and, and this is probably for asking for the, uh, for the viewer, for the listener as well, is that one thing that you touch is that we start, this pandemic kind of threw off our routine. So maybe someone had the nine to five job and here they are, they're staying at home now with the kids around. How, how, did, you, how did you figure out that routine? Like what's your routine like now? So my routine, it, it's, it's not easy. And every day I'm kind of reinvent, especially now with school starting, our kids are in-person school. So it kind of shifted a reinvention of it. It's kind of governed by one question. And I kind of work my way back from that question. What am I going to wish I did more of 10 years from now? 10 years when I reflect back on this quarantine and the whole COVID year, what am I going to wish more of? Am I going to wish I made more phone calls and tried to hustle more and make more money? or I'm gonna really wish I was more intentional with my kids. So kind of a golden rule they have is when I'm overwhelmed, when I don't know what to do, or when my routine's falling to crap, I just err on dad. That, that's my signal that I need to go for a bike ride with the kids, that's my signal we need to go to the park. And I always just kind of erred on having more dad connection because I knew that that's what I would want 10 years from now. And the crazy part is when you err where your heart is, like for me, I love being a dad. When I'm a dad, I feel more alive than anything. I actually have more business ideas than I do when I'm just sitting at my desk. So I've just erred on being a dad more and let the rest kind of flow in and naturally happen. So like most of summer, I had enough podcast episodes recorded where I just got to focus on being dad and I didn't do a lot of meetings. I didn't do a lot of conversations, but now that school's back on, I feel more connected. I feel like I can move forward because I was really intentional with that time throughout those years there. Mm -hmm. I love the word intentional. So, you know, setting up that intention of what, what, what do I want to leave myself with 10 years from, from right now? So that legacy that we can leave behind. And even as a stay home dad, I'm going to like even homeschool. Like if we had to homeschool, I was looking forward to it because when are you ever going to get that opportunity again? It sucks. It's hard. There's lots of pressure, but one thing that people aren't looking through the lens on this whole COVID mm -hmm. pressure creates growth. And it sucks in the moment, but I'm a stronger person because of everything that I've gone through in COVID. And I've lost 20 pounds during COVID. I never had a beard before. I look and feel stronger than I ever have in my life. And I've had more connection with my kids. Like my kids will look back and be like, this was the year that dad was home the most. And no matter what happens in the future, if I have to get a job or whatever, this was the year that dad was super present. And I'm positive they'll remember it as a very positive experience looking back on it in their life. And that's what I want, because that's what matters. I have a, we talked about intention and legacy, like what you do on this earth matters, but what you leave behind is 10 times more important. So for me as a dad, I'm just focused on being a dad and you can't beat yourself up too much because yesterday ended yesterday and today's a brand new day. And you just really try it again. Like my issue of trying to fight my ego, it's a daily battle that I just try different things to chip it away. Time happens to have be a good medicine for that. But it's just one of those that you just consciously be aware, work through the emotion and try to hopefully get through it. And it's hard every day that ends with why, but that's life. And to me, the like where I used to work in a good example, like I was there for eight years, like that pushed me to figure out more of who I am because I wasn't necessarily happy. I had to dig deeper. It's part of the reason why I have all the things I'd had today because the pressure of not feeling happy in my career pushed me to find something better. So in this case, Corona is pushing people and just making sure that you're being pushed in the right direction is the key. But just understand that like carbon is created under pressure and that turns into a diamond. So mm -hmm. while this sucks, we're all kind of being forced into something more beautiful. We just got to understand that we're being worked right now. And hopefully as you work through what you're going through, it'll reveal something deeper. Yeah. It reminds me of a quote by Napoleon Hill. Um, he said, every adversity, every failure 
every heartache carries with its uh, carry with with it carry with it the seed of equal or greater benefit amen yeah like as long as i don't die from covid this will be my best year of my life like i can hands down say that i've never felt more alive and done more crazy things and exciting things than i have this year so tell us about the future we're moving forward into the future now so the future looks for me as staying a stay-at-home dad. Don't know how long, probably till it, till it suits me. And being a dadpreneur, I want to move more into the professional speaking, but then also into the coaching space to help dads really reconnect with their families. I'm expanding a little bit past the military dad, so I'm looking to work with more dads in general that understand that there's something deeper inside and they want to help reveal that and pull it away and excavate, like that's a big thing within coaching that I talk about is you have to excavate who you are to really reveal it. And you gotta dig down before you can build up. And most of us are building up and we're just building a house of cards. So I wanna get into that more sustainable coaching and professional speaking, but those are my two priorities. And I'm okay doing less in these early years because again, erring on dad, there's a golden rule that this year is, these are the years everybody wants back, eight, six and four, these are the golden years of childhood where you're their hero. You're their first, you're my daughter's first love. I have two daughters. Like I'm going to do less, but sustain more. And I can do big things when they don't want to hang out with me, when they leave, when they're in college. Like for me right now, it's about sustainment and it's about being dead. Yeah. And, and you are their superhero. I can only imagine. And, and Ben posted a picture that um, he had a couple of days ago when he was celebrating the 36 years birthday. And he had kids around, surrounding him. It's just a, the most beautiful, heartfelt picture. That it felt I very heartfelt. Because I was on my way back from San Diego that day. I was in a wedding on Saturday. And so I was traveling all day. And the kids were super excited to see me like they normally would be. They probably had 25 signs around the house in different spots with my desk, my dresser, my bed, the office, the living room, the dining room, the door, the side, the driveway, all saying happy birthday. And they were so excited to show me them all. Like that's the hero's welcome. And that's the gift that you have from your kids. Like whether you messed up yesterday or not, it doesn't matter. If you're kids, you're still their hero and they forgive in seconds. And we often forgive in years, but you have to recognize they forgive in seconds and if you would just embrace that, like, I mean, that was a very good Kodak moment, but just getting the next day, we were back into, daddy, you're the worst daddy ever. I'm never hanging out with you again. Like life is going to be ups and downs, but it's about just understanding a perspective. Like they're a child trying to figure out what's going on in their world. I'm a 36 year old. I should be more in control of my emotions than them. And usually it's a game of, we're both not in control of our emotions. So it's a game of shouting back and forth. But it's just recognizing that life isn't going to be perfect and you want to hold on to the good ones. And it's that picture like kind of shows you like there is exactly what you want in life there. You just have to understand that there's going to be highs and lows in fatherhood and parenthood for moms as well. Mm -hmm. I, I wish I have a picture because right now I have a mental picture of you coming home from the military, coming off your duty and you have your family holding the sign, welcome home. Um, versus now you have your kids, you know, as you're coming home from- I hadn't connected it to that. My mom did have a, a, I was stationed in Okinawa and my mom did meet me at Chicago O'Hare once with a sign when I first came back home for the first time from Okinawa. And for boot camp, they were there in, in at graduation. So it was you also- You should put them very, side by uh, side with a picture that you have now. It's a great contrast of what really deep meaning of dad, welcome home. And you know what the crazy part, my mission of my podcast is to bring every dad home. And like that picture symbolizes like that emotional feeling when you feel like I am home, I feel whole, I'm surrounded by the people that I love and I'm exactly where I need to be versus like, oh, I got to worry about those emails or other things that we're worried about catching up with. Like, I mean, that stuff matters, but it doesn't matter. Going back to priorities, like your wife, your kids and work like that's where it needs to be because those other connections are going to go longer in the future than anything you ever do at work. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ben, for coming to the show. Before I let you go, this is a question I always ask my, uh, my, my guests. Um, in one word, what do you believe the world needs? Friendships. Friendships. You probably saw that one coming. <laughs> no. <laughs> But, I just believe very strongly that a, a good friend is what people need. And a, a good rule that I live by 
is I always try to be the friend that I wish I had in my life when I turned 30. And as long as you have that mindset, like showing up for like being the friend that you wish you had in that moment, you'll always be the right friend. Amen to that. Thank you, Ben. Thank, Thank you, you very everyone. much for your time on this. And let me come on and share my story. Of course, it's a very motivational and inspiring and it's very needed story, um, especially. It's a, it's, it's, it's a simple stuff and we don't talk about the simple stuff. Like people aren't talking about how you need more friends in life, but that's often what we need more of. We need to feel more connected to people. And don't forget the now power more than of ever. hello. Yes, the power of hello. Yes. Thank you, Ben. And thank, thank you, you everyone joining us uh, every week on Wednesday at 8 o'clock and this is my coffee talk show so I will see you all next week with another episode bye